Bob, it's Bob and Tony. Can you hear us okay? Hi, Bob. Yeah. Excellent. It's such an honor to have you on again, Bob. We Good just, evening, Bob. We just gave a background of, uh, again, of your lengthy resume. And again, it's an honor to have you on the show once Certainly again. Certainly is. Thank you. It's fun to be with you. Bob, we wanted to, I had talked to you earlier this evening, and you had told me that you uh, have an upcoming honor that had a kind of humorous spin, and you wanted to share with our viewers. Good. Do you want me to begin now? Absolutely. Yes, please. Well, I got a call about a week or so ago from the uh, Navy Department. <laughs> it's been a long time since I was in the Navy, <laughs> but it brought back cherished memories for me because through pure luck, I got started with my broadcasting career at doing Navy work. Mm -hmm. Here's what happened. I went to Duke University to be a baseball player, and when I was down there, I broke my ankle, so I sidelined. But I thought, I love sports. What can I do in sports? And I thought, well, I, I heard about something called sports casting. Maybe I could broadcast the games and do it on shows or something like that because uh, I felt that I, I enjoyed telling stories. So I went to the local radio station and told them it would be a good thing if I did some games for them because I'm a Duke guy going to classes. But uh, if I get a job broadcasting the games, that would be fun too. And if they could pay me for it, it would help me to pay my way through college. So they said, okay, we'll put you on. And no, no sooner did I start doing the basketball games on the Durham, North Carolina station, CBS, I was doing a game every night because they did only, not only Duke games, but they did games through North Carolina, Wake Forest, NC State, all of the, the college teams in, in, in the Carolinas. And they liked my work, and they said, you like to do something else? And I said, sure. So... I put on a weekly variety show on a Duke campus using two acts, singing with a band, writing the show, etc. And we sold out the theater every week in the, the campus theater. And before you know it, they offered me a full-time job to be a, a broadcaster. So I decided, okay, well, I'd go to school, I'd get paid to be a broadcaster, and I'd do sleep fewer hours, but that's how I got started. And at the end, the, the, then all of a sudden, the World of War II came along. And I, the Navy called me and said, we know you have a broadcasting background. We'd love to use you to sell war bonds in a Navy uniform because we know that you can you sing, you, you tell jokes, you do on shows. We'd like to use you to do that as well. So I put on a variety show every week which was the, the biggest show in town and sold out every week. And when the Navy called, they said, here's what we'd like you to do. We want you to head a war bond drive with some movie stars, Charles Lawton, Virginia Gilmore, and wow. Rutherford, and uh, we'll put you on that. And then after that, we'll have uh, you do some other shows for us, and, uh, and that'll be part of what you do for the Navy. So that's what I did. And... Uh, then the first assignment they gave me after the ponchos, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes, fine. Okay. So after that, uh, after I got through with my, my uh, emceeing these shows on land, they said, well, now we've got another big job for you. And I said, here's what I'd like you to do. We want to make a drive with the Navy up into Japan. It was against Japan. But we, what we have to do is we have to put the Navy on bases, land bases, in order to bring in the supplies. We need to get the airplanes in there so they can make their strikes up further north toward the Japan itself. <clears throat> We'd like you to put in charge of, of doing all of the work there as a supply officer. You'd be a lieutenant when you were doing it. And uh, would you want to do that? And I said, great. So I, I looked at what was being done. I went overseas into a South Pacific island, which was full of trees, plenty of, of rain. I was in charge of a, a CB group, which is now working for the Navy, and their job was to level all the, the trees, 
make it a landing base for the uh, Navy, Navy to come in. You'd also have to build places to live, medical quarters. You'd have to have a commissary to feed these guys. You'd have to have a recreation place. We want to take the responsibility for all of this. I said, sure. So uh, does it develop? I think the first thing I've got to do is to change the rules because we were sort of living by <clears throat> what I made up in my mind. They ought to be able to do. All of our supplies were buried in mud. We had, the food we had was out of boxes of, of K rations, they were called. As I, I wrote a book about how to do all this stuff together. And then I got airmail orders. I sent the book to Washington. They said, we want you to fly back immediately. We're going, to, we're going to publish your book as the way that the thing should run thing in the Navy Supply Corps on land, the land bases. The, the book was published. They called me back to make a movie. <clears throat> they called me back to make sure everybody in the Navy knew what to do on land. And that's how I got to Washington, where I married a Navy nurse, where I was put in charge of running the, the whole Supply Corps on when I came to a land base. <laughs> And when the war was over, I said, hey, this is fun. So the Washington Post hired me as, as a, a, a broadcaster for them. The TV station hired me as their face play-by-play guy. And that's how my whole, my whole sports career began. Just sure, sure look. <laughs> and that's my story. And now the Navy is making a movie about this. And next week they'll be helping to put that together. Isn't that, Isn't that a wonderful story? Yeah, we uh, we have to stay on top of that, Bob. And you know, we had given so, some of your lengthy resume before you came on, especially as far as the uh, baseball on on uh, the '56 Don Larson perfect game and the uh, the '58 NFL championship game. But uh, speaking of baseball, Bob as today was pretty much opening day for most of baseball, is there any opening day in the past that really still stands out in your mind? Well, so many. I, I, was, I felt I was so lucky to start out doing Major League Baseball games mm. that I, I, everyone was really a great thrill for me. And in Washington, particularly, at the, when I started out, the president threw out the first pitch. Wow. I remember... It was a big day there because uh, President Harry Truman was slated to pet, pitch it out, and he wasn't really much of a, a, a baseball player. In fact, there were big odds going on whether he pitched lefty or righty. They didn't know. <laughs> well, as it developed, he pitched one lefty and one righty, and of course, they had a big group of senator ball players and the players on the other team trying to catch his, his first pitch which was finally done, and uh, later on in life, when, after he was out of office, I called him at his home in Kansas City and said, I'd love to come out and, and now get to know you better, and he said, come on out, and we, we chose baseball all day. <laughs> isn't that fascinating? And isn't it true, Bob, that you had uh, been announcing at his inauguration? That I did what? Uh, that was President Truman's inauguration back in the day? Oh, yeah, well, then... They had a big parade for his inaugural, hmm. and they said, who, who can air live a little bit? And they said, well, there's a guy doing the baseball games. He lives everything he does. So uh, the networks pulled together and said, Let, let's use Bob Wolf to be the presidential inaugural announcer, which I did. And then, then, then when Eisenhower came in, I went over and he did his parade as well. That is unbelievable. Amazing amazing story. Again, an amazing You know, all this stuff is pure luck. But I happened to be in Washington. All these things happened. They called me to do them. And it was not planned. It was just I happened to be the guy. So. And it worked well. Again, we are honored to be on the phone with uh, the, the great Bob Wolf. Tony, questions? Bob, it's an unbelievable pleasure. Thank you so much again for being here. I wanted to talk to you about your singing career. Now, I didn't know this. You had actually sung with a band and then... You had formed a singing group with the Washington Senators. Is is this a true statement? That that's a true statement. And in fact, one of the things that that I felt helped me as a broadcaster is for exciting exciting games like big big plays and catches, home runs, and so forth. I, I sang 
I sang the word, what a hit, home run, he scores! I, I, all I did was sing the words, so I never had a sore throat. It sounded exciting. I did that all my life when I did the, the Don Larson game, the World Series games, whatever they happened to be. I just sang the words, and they sounded exciting. So when I used to teach kids what to do, I'd say, hey, look, let me hear you see the game. Here's a home, say, a home run. Kid would say, home run. No, I said, no, this, home run. That's the way you do it, and that's the way I did it. And, uh, yes, I sang with a band while I was in college as well. I sang with a band when I was on, on, in, the, in the Navy, um, singing as well. I, I appeared on a lot of shows when I was young, younger than that. And uh, I used singing as part of the technique in broadcasting. It's, it's an amazing story. And, Bob, one of the things I, I did want to ask you about, your list of interviews is so unbelievably long. I mean, too much that we can possibly mention here, but uh, Babe Ruth, Jackie Robinson, Ted Williams. What is your approach in an interview, and what do you do to bring that person out to communicate with you? One word, two words, actually. One I was just plain curious as a person. If he's a ball player, if he's an entertainer, if he's a politician, I love to probe deep, not just plain ordinary questions. I like to have questions where people listen and say, Dad, Dad, I didn't know that. That's interesting. No wonder he, I, I always look for the unusual because I felt it was more entertaining. So I felt that when I broadcast, and I did thousands of broadcasts, that I love to have the guy laughing, feeling comfortable, feeling at ease, as if we were having a chat, but I kept going for humor all the time. For example, when the Vice President Nixon was in the ball game, I said to him one day, I said, tell you what, I'm going to do a show between games, a radio show, and I know you're a terrific baseball fan, but I'd like to interview you, but don't reveal that you're the vice president until I ask you what you do here. He said, sure, I'll play along with you. So here I did a, a show with him, and where are you from, and how do you get interested in baseball, on and on. And at the end of the time, what, what do you do? He said, well, I work for the government. Well, that's nice. A lot of people do in Washington. What do you do? He said, well, I work for the, I work for the president. He said, yeah, what's your job? He said, I'm the vice president of the country. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I kept doing the most unusual shows that I could do for everybody I interviewed, and they all wanted to come with me because it was going to be a, a fun experience. And that's what I did. I did uh, shows which went across the country. Yeah, I, I, everybody, I, all the stars came in, didn't matter which scene they were on. I interviewed it, but they came to me because it was going to be a, a fun experience for them. That's something. That's a magnificent story. Something. And, and, uh, and Bob, today, <clears throat> Tony and I were talking, and he was actually uh, watching the Dodger game today. And uh, huge is the fact that Vin Scully was not no in the broadcast booth. And I, and I know, as a Fordham graduate, and uh, uh, somebody that was very familiar with him, and I know a guy like yourself who crossed paths with him so many times and was a friend to him. I uh, just want to know some memories of Vin, and uh, what's your opinion of the man? Well, I knew Vin and admired Vin, but I didn't really know him well, because mm. year after year my conversation was, Hi, Vin, good to see you. Yeah, Bob, good to see you. And he went his way, and I went my way. We never had to talk. But uh, the day before yesterday, I got a, a phone call from Ben Scully just to have a chat for the first time, and I was thrilled to receive it. Well, he has time to do it now. That's, that's something. <laughs> but uh, That's magnificent. Isn't that incredible? And, again, we talked about how you crossed over from every sport, Bob. And I want to know if you remember... I was watching the, uh, I'm sure you remember, the 77 Nick game when you were calling the game with Cal Ramsey against the New Orleans Jazz when Pete Maravich lit up the Knicks for 68 points. To this day, Bob, 
that remains to me without the three-point shot and just the way he was that night, the greatest performance I've ever seen on a basketball court. But you and Cal were almost um, in shock at times during that telecast. I played it back last week. Uh, your memories of that, it was, it, it was just something to watch. Yeah, how do you have it or have that? Oh, what actually, I found on YouTube, it was, uh, uh, it, it basically went through Maravich's every basket, and it was yourself and Cal Ramsey doing the game, Bob, and it was just, Cal at times just was, uh, he says, I, I don't know how anyone could stop the man, but it was just amazing, uh, it, 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 an incredible night, but I'm sure you've seen so many of them, but that was, uh, that was one of your most, I remember as far as one of your most memorable, call, memorable calls in basketball. Mm -hmm. How would, how would I track it down so I could hear it myself? Uh, that I'll have to get back to you. That on YouTube, if you uh, if you if you probably search on YouTube for uh, Maravich Nix nineteen seventy seven, it'll come right up. But uh, nineteen seventy seven, right? Yes, great. and it great. was. I'll, I'll track it down because I love to hear it. You know, I've, <laughs> I've saved a lot of my tapes, but most I haven't. <laughs> Those yeah. safes that I saved, I sent to the yeah. Library of Congress. Yeah, absolutely. Tony had talked uh, off the air about that. 1,400 of them, and they're going to become digitalized, which is, that's incredible. And we thank yeah. you for doing that, Bob. Tony. Bob, you know, as far as um, baseball broadcast today, they're long affairs, they're drawn out, uh, the game is drawn out, the pitchers are obsessed with counts. When you were broadcasting, games were simple. It was two, three camera coverage. The players worked quickly. The coverage was more simpler. Uh, in your mind, was that a better world for broadcasting than what you're seeing today? <laughs> well, when I did it, that was the way it was done. In fact, when I started um, as the play-by-play -play guy, I didn't have a collar man. It was just I did I did both I was I was a, the broadcaster and I brought in all the other entertainment part of the game and there was just one of us it took about fifteen twenty years that I was all alone as a solo now there's only one soloist in all of baseball and that's Vin who's now retired because Vin's style of the slower pace in which he enunciated every word beautiful tones and so forth. His style was to weave in all the extras without waiting for the color man to come in who changed the pacing of the game. Mm -hmm. And only then was allowed to do it because he, he did it so well. But nowadays, the color man is really more important than the broadcaster because he's giving all the inside information if he's good at it. He's bringing a little humor or entertainment or something different to the game. So you'll find that the, the color guys, particularly those who are a little strange or weird in their offerings, they, they, they make the headlines. And the play-by-play -play guy just does it sort of straight. Mm -hmm. Do I like that style more? Well, in the old days, the guys are so colorful, the, the top ones, that there was no need for a color man. Yeah, that's, uh, they weren't the show, right? Mm -hmm. Well said. Yeah, very well said. Well said. And, Bob, I, we had mentioned the 1956 the World Series game, Don Larson. I was just wondering, while you were doing that broadcast, uh, you know, the, the whole thing with no hitters, especially in the World Series, and uh, did you have any idea that you supposedly might be jinxing a man by uh, – was it – was that in the news back then that people could be jinxing somebody by bringing up the fact that a man has a no-hitter? I, I guess it was your duty to do that. Well, for one thing, as I said, I started out to, to be a ball player. Mm -hmm. that, was, that was my ambition, to get to the major leagues. I never did, but I was a, a pretty good ball player. And in my family, uh, I have uh, one son who was a, a drafted ball player. He's mm -hmm. now a businessman, but he... He, he was an excellent professional ball player. His son was a drafted ball player. So baseball in particular has been a big part of our lives. Mm -hmm. Now we have a, a family with uh, not only youngsters and their children, but we have great -grand, 11 great-grandchildren. God bless you. So we, we have a lot of sports and baseball still going on. But the thing is, during, during those days, you never spoke about a no-hitter. It was in progress. Mm -hmm. That was taboo. You, you jinxed the game. Ah. And I went along with that. 
So I thought to myself, someday, maybe I'm going to have to do a note here. What would I do? So during the ball game, I spoke to the producer of the shows for the Gillette Safety Reason Company, and I said, to Joe, his name was Joe Mixon, wonderful man. I said, Joe, we're the halfway point. I said, so far, Sal Magli is pitching a no-hitter, a close to it, and and uh, certainly Don Larson is. How do, how do you want me to handle this? Should I use the words no-hitter? He said, no, we go along and let people know coast to coast. I was coast to coast on the games and on the on services radio as well. He said, just let people know there's a no-hitter going on. So every inning I say, well, they put down Larson now is so far the Dodgers have gone down so many in a row. The only people on base so far have been the Yankees, on and on. Can you hear that? He said, sure. They don't know what exactly what you're talking about. So I let people know every inning that the only people on base have been the New York Yankees. And nobody complained coast to coast. Nobody complained at all. And they all knew what was happening. And that's the way that I did it. And, uh, Bob, as far as um, recent times, we're having a renewed interest. Uh, Marty Appel's written a book on Casey Stengel. And we're beginning to really see, once again, the historical qualities of Casey and how much of a part of baseball he was. And really, we're never going to see his like again. But you'd spent a lot of time with Casey. What were your impressions of him? <laughs> well... Casey was a born performer. Many times I went out early to the ball game, and Casey was there in a dugout. There were one or two people who the reporters at the time. But the moment that he saw me, he started in on the dugout steps, speaking a little louder, so people would know it was Casey speaking. There he was. And now people were kind of drifting in from all over the dugouts, to hear Casey Stengel, and he just held held the audience just like that. I always had a front row seat because I was the first one to be w with him. And one day I said to Casey, I said, Casey, let me do this. I can get some sponsors who can give you thousands of dollars if you let me follow you for a couple of nights and I'll record everything you said because he kept speaking like that when the game was over into the wee night going on and on, talking, giving some... I said, I'll put the money together, you can make a fortune out of it, and I'll put it on, get it on the airwaves. So we discussed that uh, week after week. We never got around to it, but, but it, we came awful close to doing it. He, he was just, the amazing thing about Casey Singer was that when he left the Yankees and he became the Mets manager, that he then made the Mets the most lovable team in town because everybody rooted for the Mets. I mean, to have a losing team be watched so faithfully because Casey Sengel was, was telling you about it. He, he kidded about how poor the team was. He called them his Metsies. He got people really <laughs> sympathetic, how bad they were. And uh, he was, it was remarkable to see a losing manager get such applause every time he appeared. And Bob, switching gears just a little bit to, to, uh, to further demonstrate the versatility you have, Tony and I discussed before the show how you were the voice of the Westminster Dog Show for over 30 years. And, uh, and Tony and I said, uh, first of all, I was wondering, number one, how you became involved. Number two, was it a very an enjoyable event for you to cover? Well, that was one of the few events where I really knew nothing about dogs, but I did have a dog, and I was attached to him just like a part of the family. But I never realized that all I had to do was, was work hard. So if anybody said, can you do the dog show? Oh, of course, dog show. How about the horse show? Yes. How about gymnastics? Of course. How about on and on? I never said no, because I realized Everybody had to learn something about the sport if they, they wanted to do it. So if, if I took a sport that I'd never done before, I went out and learned the sport by being there in person, by being curious, by asking questions. Example, 
when I first started doing ice hockey, I didn't know anything about it. I had played roller hockey in the backyards and stuff like that with on cement bases. But the thing is, I went out, I stayed with the players, and finally I got one guy named Andy Vat to the ranches. I said, Andy, I'd love to, when I go on trips, let me sit with you and just talk ice hockey with you. Let's, I just want to learn enough about the sport so basically people know and trust me to explain how the game is played, all the techniques. And we did that. But when I did it, finally after a year, after a couple of months of doing it, I said, you know, I have about 200 pages of notes I've taken with you. If I put these in literature on a book, that would be a great book. Would you go along with that? He said, sure. I said, will other people do it the same way as you did? He said, not really. These are my, the way that I did things. So that book became the best-selling ice hockey book in Canada. I recall and the book. I, I was in demand to make speeches all over Canada about how, how you play the sport. The sport. <laughs> it, was, it was an amazing thing. It shows it can be done. And I went at every sport that I did, I worked the same way to do it. Bob, uh, one more for me, and then I'll pass you to Tony to wrap it up. But uh, I had read over the weekend about you having done an interview, of course, with Ty Cobb. And uh, we had remembered him uh, as far as reading about his career, how fierce he was a competitor, how maybe unliked he was, not the nicest guy. But sitting down with him, what did you find out more about him as a person? When I first met Ty Cobb, he, he was an older man. Mm -hmm. So that old, I, I guess you guys know I'm the longest running broadcaster of all team time. Do you yes, know that? Yes, we do. We do. <laughs> We're quite so, honored. <laughs> no, but, listen, it's always a great pleasure for me and honor when I wake up the next morning. I said, oh, gosh, I'm still here. This is amazing. But at any rate, We're glad. Ty Cobb, when he, got, when he gets to be an older man, was very sensitive about his reputation that he was a, a tough, ornery old guy. And he'd say to me, Bob, let me get on your radio show or TV show and explain to people they'd heard that I around, went around spiking people and stuff like that. He said, look, when I slide into a base, I'm on the ground. He said, every guy that played against me jumped up in the air when they're making a play at second base. And they come right down on me. He said, my legs are full of spike grounds. You see, at the last laugh, they were on top all the time. So he said, I didn't inflict any injury. Why would I put my, my legs up in the air? Just if I did, I couldn't go into the base. He said, I, I hope you get people straight that I was really a great, great guy. Never hurt anybody. That's uh, some spin, right? <laughs> it's Isn't that so psycho. <laughs> Tony. And, Bob, I um, was reading a little bit about you in your recent article in the New York Post, and uh, I understand you've got some designs on the future and some entertainment work you'd like to do. Can you <laughs> explain that to us? <laughs> yeah, the, the oddity is, and my family knows very well, for some reason, when I go out to events that I've been at, let's say, 20 or 30 years, I'd say, well, look, let me end with a... I t sing, do you take me out to a ball game? And they'd get up at the end and give me a standing ovation, which I didn't deserve. But they think, yeah, this guy's a little wacky, I'm sure, but uh, he's fun to be around. So I still, I still do that, and I still play it. But the thing is that uh, I think that if you bring... I've always felt really... I, I was not really a broadcaster. It's like I was a broadcast entertainer, or at least tried to be, and I got away with it. Uh, it was a different touch that I had. By the way, I worked with the best comedian that I've ever, I've ever worked with, which was Joe Garagiola. Uh, yeah. Joe Garagiola was doing the, the baseball game of the week. Now, that guy was really funny. Naturally we, funny. We loved him. We loved him. Yeah, we really, yeah, did. really. He, I learned so much about baseball from him. Mm. And you. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Well, Bob, our time is just about up. Uh, we... Again, we can't thank you enough. We, we, We're honored. Uh, is there so much we can talk to you in the future? We've already had you on a couple of times. We, uh, we just love having you on. We're honored again. And we want to send regards to your family, especially your son, Rick, who has joined us in the past. Please yes, send our regards true. to him. And uh, 
Please remain in touch, and uh, we will still be watching you, sir. It's always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. You called on me. But anytime you want some more, just to fill in, give me a call. I'm available. Uh, we'll, we'll take you up on that, sir. Again, Bob, uh, please be well, and uh, we'll talk soon again. Okay. Great luck, guys. Good night. Take care. Good night. Good night. Again, we're uh, beyond honored to talk to Mr. Wolf uh, for the second time, Tony. And he's 96 years old, and he's starting a new endeavor. <laughs> and again, and that's uh, everybody out there that says, "Oh, there's no hope for me." <laughs> yeah, the uh, his is the type of career, the type of interview that there's really not much you can add to what are the facts. Uh, a nine decade, spanning a nine decade, a broadcasting career that will never be approached. He's already in the uh, Guinness Books, as we as we mentioned, Tony, for 70-something years of uh, broadcasting. Longest tenured broadcaster ever, and that includes the aforementioned Vince Scully. But uh, there, again, when you're preparing for something like this, Tony, we had him on already. There's really not much there that he hasn't done, so it's really just picking from a... a, a well, 70 year stretch of, uh, and it's just what a joy to speak with that man. And you learn so much for the fact that uh, he was saying we had baseball games years ago where we had a broadcaster. Now we have a color man. And the reason why the games moved along much more simply was the broadcaster could handle the whole thing. Mel Allen didn't need a color man. Vince Scully didn't need a color man. Bob Wolf didn't need a color man. You know, it was. And, and finally, it's like, yeah, dummy, that's the problem. We don't have talents like that anymore. It's almost like they needed that extra guy to provide some kind more of, entertainment, right. more fill-in, like he said. I mean, yeah. were you ever bored at listening to Lindsey Nelson do a baseball game? Or, or Of course not. And, uh, Tony, is, simple isn't as that it kind of humorous difficult. where Mr. Wolf said, if you ever need somebody to fill in on the show? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> A Hall of Famer, folks, yeah, talking to great. us on MNST uh, as uh, if we need filler. I'm glad so. this chair has arms.